So you want to know about Caesar, but I can't talk about Caesar without talking about what happened to Rome during his lifetime. Everything that happened from his birth to his death had a massive impact on the type of man Caesar would be. To keep it simple, I'll just focus on Julius Caesar instead of his nephews, great nephews and relatives like that. Just a heads up, Romans have a lot of names so I'll try to simplify to what they're best known for. So most people will be called by their most prominent name like Caesar or Pompey. Get ready for a lot of Latin and exorbitant details to understand half of what happened. Important to know that with Roman history, often on topics you will find yourself being pulled down tangents to try to understand what's happening. Warning, this covers the history of Rome around Caesar's life, and not all of that history is pleasant. The history of Caesar has intense acts of violence, cruelty and notions that may be considered offensive in modern times. Listener's discretion be advised. Gaius Julius Caesar was born on the 12th of July, 653 years since the founding of Rome, or 100 BCE. He was a renowned politician and general for the Roman army. His family was an ancient aristocratic line that could be traced back to the founding of Rome known as a patrician family. Prior to the conflicts of the order in 500 BCE, the patricians were held in high esteem as they were the descendants of the 100 men appointed by the first King Romulus. After the conflict, however, being a patrician was basically the same as being a noble in medieval Europe. In the Roman Republic, two distinct groups held political power, the patricians and the plebeians. Plebeians basically being fancy talk for everyone else that wasn't a patrician. There was also the slave caste but they didn't have any political power so they are not included. Caesar's family was known as the Gens Julia, a family that traced their lineage back to a common ancestor. It was the ancestor Gaius Julius Lullus of the Gens Julius line that held the position of consul in the year 489 BCE, just 20 years after the last Roman king was deposed and a republic was established. In Caesar's time, Many Romans took pride in the fact that they were a part of a republic, having overthrown their last king roughly 400 years ago. So much so that Marcus Unius Brutus, Quinus Servilus Cepia Brutus, same guy just a different name after he was adopted by a relative, or just Brutus, proudly claimed to be the descendant of Lucius Unius Brutus, one of the founders of the Roman Republic and helped overthrow Narquin the bloody tyrant. Gen Julius line claimed to be either the descendants of Trojans who fled after the city's destruction to the descendants of a king of Latium, what exactly does it matter that it's important to know that their line was known for being a prestigious one. The surname Caesar is said to have come from the praetor, basically a general, magistrate position, Sextus Julius Caesar of 208 BCE possibly being derived from the Moorish word for elephant because he is said to have killed one, the Latin word lucut, sis, a great quantity of hair or because his eyes color. The third one is the most believed because of a grammarian in the 2nd century CE, leading it to become the most commonly believed one. Before the age of 16 and not much is known about Caesar because no one decided to write down what was going on. All we know is that in 85 BC, Caesar's father also known as Gaius Julius Caesar died and the 16-year-old was now the head of the household. It was also around this time that there was a small thing called a civil war going on in Rome. The two parties were the husband of Caesar's aunt, Julia, Gaius Marius, and Cinna, as the Marians, against General Lucius Cornelius Sulla. This was because Sulla led his army and marched into Rome, more specifically crossing the Pomerium with his army. This was huge because the Pomerium marked where the original walls of Rome stood. Crossing it with an army had a huge symbolic meaning as with one exception, no weapons were allowed across the Pomerium. Though it was just a series of marker stones, every Roman adhered to the rule and only crossed the Pomerium in designated areas. Doing otherwise meant death. Might be a bit of an overreaction but these are the Romans and they did things their way. Now to extremely simplify, 
score left to fight in the first Mithridatic War, allowing the Marians to hermit Crabbin and seize power. They had about a hundred Roman citizens put to death because they were loyal to Sulla and set the decapitated heads in the public forum, the area that pretty much every Roman citizen frequented. The two men in charge of the Marian faction, Marius the Elder and Cinna basically said that everything Sulla did was bad and stupid so it doesn't count, and also exiled him just for that measure. Marius also took Sulla's place and appointed Cinna in charge of Sulla's eastern lands. Top it all after they declared themselves the consuls in the year 86 BCE, meaning that the Marian faction had control over Rome. Consuls had the right to veto any bill that was being passed in the Senate and along with being immune to any form of legal prosecution so long as they were in power. Consuls were only in power for a single year and alternated primary control every month. It was also after this that Marius conveniently decided to die after two weeks of being in charge, leaving Cinna as the sole power in charge of Rome. Cinna wanted Sulla to not be in charge of anything so he sent a group of men out to relieve him of command while the Mithridatic War raged on. The man that he put in charge of the task force, Flaccus, was betrayed by his second-in-command, Fimbria, and murdered. Things quickly dissolved into chaos back in the Roman Senate was murdered in a mutiny. Sulla ended in the Mithridatic War in a Roman victory and returned home. Sulla returned home and kicked everyone's arse. Marius the Younger led what remained of the Marian faction's army and fought Sulla's forces in combat. They lost and in the year 81 BCE the survivors of the Marian faction fled to Sicily, the province of Africa the lands of modern Tunisia, and Hispania, Spain. Sulla sent a task force of six regions, 120 warships and 800 transport ships sent to Sicily under the command of one general Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus or Pompey the Great. Pompey also captured the Roman province of Africa after retaking Sicily. With the last of the Marian faction captured or killed, Sulla was declared the dictator of Rome. Dictator had a very different meaning back then, basically meaning they had full control over the Roman government, military and policies in a time of crisis. The consuls also had very limited veto power over the dictator's decision and all the magistrates were expected to adhere to the dictator's decision. The dictators were also limited to only having control of matters directly related to the reasoning that they were elected dictator in a maximum duration of six months of power. After nearly six years of civil war, the Roman Republic was in dire need of some financial stimulation so dictator Sulla declared a potent proscription. Proscription meant that anyone was deemed to have not acted in the best interest of the Republic was to have their assets liquidated to be given to the Republic before being murdered. The exact number of proscribed citizens is unknown, but it is believed to be anywhere between 1,500 to 9,000 Roman citizens of high standing. Any attempt to harbor a proscribed citizen would be met with immediate execution, if a Roman citizen personally killed a proscribed citizen then they can receive some sort of financial compensation. One of these proscribed citizens was Julius Caesar, Marius's relative. It was only because Caesar had relatives that were Sulla's supporters he was able to survive the proscription of violent culling. Sulla enacted several major political reforms, with the primary being the reduction of the power of the plebeians and the increase of the Roman Senate from 300 to 600 senators. With his last flex, Sulla expanded the Pomerium, the first to do so since the last king of Rome. You'd think that with his power, Sulla would remain as dictator but in 81 BCE he stepped down and re-established the normal consular government, before running and winning the consul seat in the year 80 BCE. That story had a direct impact on the life of Caesar as he had witnessed firsthand what a proscription was and the impacts that they had. Caesar was also at the time the Flamen Dialis, high priest of Jupiter. The position that he was stripped of given the fact that he was related by marriage to Marius and by extension his faction. So instead of being murdered, he just lost his job, 
the dowry for his wife Cornelia and his inheritance. Choosing not to divorce his wife, Caesar instead fled. It was only because the family of Aurelia Cotta, his mother, intervened. It was, ironically, because he was stripped of his position as the high priest that Caesar was allowed to join the army. The high priest has several major constraints on what they were allowed to do. They couldn't sleep outside the bed for more than three days. They couldn't sleep outside of Rome for one day. They couldn't ride a horse. They couldn't touch metal. They couldn't see a dead body. They couldn't look at an army. They couldn't be elected consul. They can touch flower. There were 21 major constraints on their powers but keep it simple, they could only perform their duties as a priest and had to be attended to for all other matters. So since Caesar was no longer a flame in Dialis, he could run for consul, govern a province and lead an army. That's what he did. Since things were so hot back in Rome he decided to join the army and was stationed in the lands known as Asia Minor, Turkey, the Caucasus region, the Levant region, Persia and the Asian Peninsula. He served in the army with distinction, earning the prestigious civic crown for his service during the Siege of Medellini, the second highest accolade a soldier could receive, just under the grass crown. The civic crown is awarded to people who quote save the lives of fellow citizens by slaying an enemy on a spot held by the enemy that same day. This was a lifelong distinction that said Roman could proudly display, while also not being limited at just one civic crown. Theoretically, it would be possible for someone to be seen walking down the streets of Rome wearing a dozen of these wreath crowns. Anyone who had said crown was entitled to entry of the Roman Senate and was required to wear said crown at every public event. He was near the end of his service at the time in 80 BCE that the 20-year-old Caesar was sent to get the king of Bithynia, a kingdom in the north of Asia Minor, Nicomedes IV to send his ships to help in the siege of Medellini, a city located on the island of Lesbos. The king agreed and it was said that the two had a close relationship after the long time they spent in each other's company. Now I'm not saying that the two were lovers, but I am and so did Suetonius and many others at the time. Bisexuality was fairly common amongst the Roman Roman aristocrats, the issue that people had was that it was said that Caesar was the bottom. If he was the top, no one would have a problem with it, but it was because he was said to be quote, Unquote passive in the relationship. Even being seen wearing a dress, scandalous. According to Roman law, a Roman citizen in the course of a homosexual relationship with a passive side was punished. But no one had any evidence so it remained as a rumor, the one that was quite prevalent even after many years. Two years later, in 78 BC, Sulla died. Now, Without someone trying to actively kill him, Caesar returned to Rome. Without his inheritance, as it had been confiscated by Sulla, Caesar could only afford a modest house in the region of Sabran Rome with his soldier's wage, a noticeably low-class area in the city. Around this time he also decided to practice legal advocacy, known for his elegance in speaking and extravagant gestures during his ruthless prosecution of corrupt former governors. Between 78 to 69 BC, Caesar set sail on the Aegean Sea and was captured by pirates. This incident is best known because when they asked for 20 talents, 680.4 kilograms or 1,500.025 pounds for Americans, of silver, Caesar insisted that he was worth more and requested that they ask for 50 talents. He was also known for being fairly relaxed with his captors and quote, unquote joking with them that once he was free he would come back with a fleet and crucify them all alive. He was mostly true to his word because he did raise a fleet of ships after he was freed and crucified them all, the only difference being that he slit the throat beforehand. This was all before he was called back to the army to fight off invaders from the east. During his stay in Rome, he was elected the military tribute, a one-year electoral position in which the military tribute was put in command of a portion of the army under a consul. 
important to know that getting elected as a military tribute was almost essential to any aspiring political figure. This is important because in 69, Nice, BC, Caesar was elected quester or investigator in which he chose to serve in the province Hispania, Spain. Before that saw the death of his first wife Cornelia, as well as the passing of his aunt Julia known as the Laudatio Amity. During the funeral procession, Caesar was noteworthy as during the ceremony Caesar said quote, The family of my aunt Julia is descended by her mother from the kings and on her father's side is akin to the immortal gods. For the Marciarages go back to Ancus Marcius, and the Iulii the family of which ours is a branch, to Venus. Our stock, therefore, has at once the sanctity of kings, whose power is supreme among mortal men, and the claim to reverence which attaches to the gods, who holds sway over kings themselves. This was definitely a way to pay her the respect she was deserved and not a shameless self-promotion of his own distinction. Now the age of 41, Caesar, serving in Hispania came across a statue of Alexander the Great and felt disheartened as he was now at the age that Alexander was at when he had conquered the lands from the Nile to the Indus River. He returned to Rome and in the year 67 BC, he married his second wife, Pompeia, granddaughter of Sulla. This marriage was a short one as in 61 BC he divorced her because of her embroilment in the Bonadi scandal. This is a story of its own but to simplify. A senator by the name of Publius Clodius Pulcher likely had slept with Caesar's wife during the Bonadi festival. A man by the name of Lucius Cornelius Lentulus Cress, someone who had a grudge against Clodius for causing a mutiny in his army and destroying his marriage, led the trial against him. Lucius Cornelius claimed that Clodius had committed incestum, not incest but incestum, a capital punishment. Incest meant that someone had violated religious purity. I.e., Ray being one of Vestal virgins who, as the name suggests, are virgins who are sacred. In this case, trying to sleep with Caesar's wife during the Bona Di festival, requiring the Vestal virgins to repeat their rituals as to not anger the gods. Anyway, the whole trial was less about defending traditions and upholding the Roman ways as Lucius Cornelius and Clodius claimed, but to smear the other. In the end, the guilty subject was found guilty and sentenced to death. Oh wait, I forgot that Clodius was rich. Instead of being punished for the crime he likely had committed, he bribed the judge with a sack of money and got off scot-free. Caesar had decided that, due to her involvement in the incident, to divorce Pompeia. The Greek writer Plutarch wrote on the incident that quote Caesar divorced Pompeia at once, but when he was summoned to testify at the trial, he said he knew nothing about the matters with which Clodius was charged. His statement appeared strange, and the prosecutor, therefore, asked, Why, then, didst thou divorce thy wife? Because, said Caesar, I thought my wife ought not even to be under suspicion. Totally not a desperate attempt to save face after a scandal. Going back a bit, Caesar was elected as Curulatus in 65 BCE which was an elective position that oversaw the maintenance of public buildings, management of public festivals enforcement of Roman laws and supplying food to the city. The Curuli Dial was joined by the Plebeian Edile a position only available to plebeians, compared to the curule which was open to plebs and patricians. During his time in office, Caesar staged extravagant games which earned him clout. Between his appointment of curule idols and the Bonadi scandal, Caesar ran for the position of Pontifex Maximus in 63 BCE. The Pontifex Maximus was basically the head of the Roman state of religion. Two well-connected senators ran against him and accusations of bribery were thrown around but Caesar somehow won against the senators with better standing and experience. Definitely didn't bribe to get the job. Also in 63 BCE Cicero gained the consulship and had to deal with the attempt to coup of Lucius Sergius Catalina or Catiline and his conspirators. 
Catiline was best known for being acquitted from his adultery with a vestal virgins thanks to a very likely dose of bribery. Catiline decided that he was dissatisfied with the Roman Republic, definitely not because he lost the consulship to Cicero, along with several aristocrats and plebeians who all were thrown out of office due to scandals, and veterans from Sulla decided to overthrow the consuls Marcus Aulius Cicero and Gaius Antonius Hybrida. This was discovered by Cicero who denounced the conspirator amongst the Senate in the temple of the chief god Jupiter. So Catiline, being the brave man he was, bravely ran away. The Catiline conspiracy was ended due in part to the conspiratorial correspondence being brought to the Senate by Cicero. With the irrefutable evidence, the five main conspirators were sentenced to death without trial, much to the objection of the Pontifex Maximus, Caesar. How ironic with hindsight! To prevent them from being freed by the Catiline and the remaining conspirators, Cicero ordered them to be strangled in their prisons immediately. Having personally escorted the centurion Sura, Cicero declared Vixir to the cheering crowds. Vixir roughly meaning they had lived, or that they were now dead. With much of their support gone, Catiline led his force of 3,000 into a final battle. Found near the front of the dead following the battle was Catiline, having thrown himself into the fighting and died with his men, bearing wounds on their front. This is important as it showed that they died in combat instead of fleeing. With the threat to the Republic over, Cicero was declared the Pater Patriae, the father of the fatherland. The love wouldn't last forever as Cicero was forced into exile five years later by Caesar and Publius Clodius Paltrow for putting Romans to death without a trial. The year after the Catiline conspiracy, Caesar was elected as propraetor, or acting governor of Hispania Ulterior, other known as southwestern Spain. But before he could go, he had to settle his debts. Knowing that what was owed exceeded his available wealth, he turned to Rome's wealthiest citizen Marcus Licinius Crassus. Crassus agreed in return for his support of Pompey. In Hispania, Caesar led a military expedition against two tribes and was proclaimed imperator in 60 BC, the highest military honor a soldier could achieve. For imperator to be recognized requires the conquest of new territories for Rome, the declaration of imperator by the soldiers and for the Senate to recognize their achievements. The problem for Caesar was that the consul election was coming up soon he needed to be present in Rome to get elected. Caesar's issue was the imperator couldn't enter the city of Rome as when soldiers cross the Pomerium, the line which separates Rome from the world, they relinquish their military powers. In the Senate, several key figures wanted Caesar to stay out of the consul seat, so they prolonged their discussion so that Caesar would miss the election. Caesar asked to be granted an in absentia which would allow him to run while not being present, a proposal which Marcus Porcius Cato Eutyacensis, Cato the Younger denied. Surprising everyone, Caesar relinquished his imperator and ran for consul by entering Rome and submitting his proposal in person. Hopefully, this deliberate act by Cato doesn't come back to haunt him. Foreshadowing This part will focus on Caesar from the year 6 to BCE until the end of the Gallic campaigns. Now let's get started. 6 to BCE is best known for the year that the first triumvirate arose. The triumvirate rule of the men was a political union of Julius Caesar, Marcus Crassus, and Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great. This is because the Roman constitution put limits on what a Roman politician could accomplish. The Roman assembly was a direct democracy where the Roman citizens got to vote directly on matters of law and the passing of legislation. So, theoretically, Roman citizens had the final say in laws. But like most things, a healthy dose of bribery could sway anything. The Roman Senate and Magistrate focused mostly on the application of bills and proposals for approval. The Triumvirate allowed each member to subtly influence the Republic and gave them the political strength to push proposals through the Senate. For safety reasons, 
This was a secret alliance. If word got out then people might accuse them of the trying to sidestep the constitutional system and allow them to act with a modicum of impunity. I mean they were but it would still look base if people knew. Anyway, each member had spheres of influence on Roman life. Caesar was the nephew of Gaius Marius, had quite the following in the popular or popular faction while also being the Pontifex Maximus which allowed him to decide matters of the faith. Pompey the Great was a renowned and respected army leader. One of the campaigns he is best known for is his work on the Third Mithridatic War and his conquests of the Sicilian pirates of modern Turkey, not Sicilian pirates. Crassus was known for his vast, vast wealth from land speculation and patronage similar to Pompey. In the Triple Alliance, Crassus and Pompey held a greater share of the power due to their stronger connections and experience. But words are cheap, unions forge lasting bonds. As such, Pompey, who was born 106 BC, married Caesar's eldest daughter Julia, who was born 76 BC, their marriage was in the year 59 BC, with roughly three decades difference between them. Yeah. Their marriage was shortened as in 55 BC, Julia was forced into premature labor from seeing her husband's bloodstained toga, thinking his death was done by the mob. Her child did not live long, neither did Julia as her health fell shortly after. At the age of 22, she was laid to rest in the field of Mars due to her popularity with the masses, and thanks to a special senatorial decree. Her death changed the fate of Rome. As she and her husband, Pompey were smitten with each other. So strong was the love that it was said that Pompey was willing to end his political career and live a domestic life. Were it not for her passing, the Roman Republic may have lasted longer than it did. But without her, the path of Pompey and Caesar was set. But more on it later. In 59 BC, the consul election took place and two figures took the consulship. Caesar and to a lesser extent, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus. Despite this year being known as the Consulship of Caesar and Bibulus, it is more often referred to as the Consulship of Julius and Caesar. This is because Bibulus was so thoroughly embarrassed during a public forum vote, he went into a self-imposed exile because of it. Unfortunately now, I need to go into the boring political realm. But I forgot this is Rome and nothing is ever boring. Because they are co-consuls, each member takes the leave for one month at a time. Now as consul, Caesar tried to push through his land reforms. As a retirement stipend for soldiers, the grant of land is common, the issue, mega farms taking the land. This was a subject of frequent proposals but often died in the Senate as bribes from the mega landowners. Bring the first Roman to secure all votes by the centurions, through bribes, gain the primary consul seat. This gave him primary command of the Senate for the first month. While Pompey and Crassus supported the proposal to grant Pompey's veterans a place to settle and gave Crassus more popularity and wealth, Bibulus and conservative Cato opposed. Pompey sent some of his veterans into Rome to help ensure that they passed the bill. When Caesar presented his reform proposal to the Forum, Bibulus opposed it. As consul, he would theoretically have been able to veto the proposal. However, the public was in favor of the plan and was said to cheer so loudly that Caesar could not hear the veto from his co-consul. To further salt the wound, Bibulus was said to have been pushed into or a dunk poured over him. Humiliated before the public, Bibulus exiled himself from the public. Because Caesar was consul while also being Pontifex Maximus, meant that he could decide if the signs were right for a vote or not. This is important as Biblius would decide when the votes for Caesar's proposals would take place if they fell outside the months in which Caesar had control over. Because he didn't like Caesar, he would plan the votes on days that were considered bad omens, when it would be wrong to hold the votes. But Caesar decided if the signs were good or not so he said that everything was okay and the votes proceeded as usual. 
This is sometimes referred to as the end of Roman democracy as a single person could ensure that their proposal would pass. After his consul ended in 58 BC, Caesar took command of a few legions and set out to Transalpine Gaul. This refers to the land beyond the Alpine Mountains, modern-day France, Switzerland, and the Low Countries. The Gallic War lasted eight years and saw the borders of Rome creep northward at a fast rate. The success of Caesar's forces can be largely attributed to the fact that the Roman army was a unified military force and the Gallic tribes were often divided due to internal conflicts and grudges against neighboring tribes. Numerous tribes sided with the foreign Romans against their neighbors if it meant that they were defeated. A strategy that would be put to good use by the Romans. If enough one all cover the complete Gallic war at a later time. To keep it simple, I'll focus on the basics of the major battles. In 58 BC, Caesar had command of six legions which was roughly 24 to 30,000 legionaries with auxiliary cavalry provided by Gauls in exchange for what was basically self-rule. The war started because the Helvetii tribes got too close to lands ruled by Roman-aligned tribes. Caesar dicked them around for several days. The Helvetii was a tribe or tribal confederation that inhabited the Swiss highlands. Caesar definitely didn't start the quote, unquote defensive campaign as a way to earn money to pay off his substantial debt. This was done by selling off much of their possessions and selling them into slavery. The war was brutal, but provided Caesar with enough wealth to fund further campaigns in Gaul. 55 BCE saw the totally successful expedition of the lands across the modern English Channel. A total success as there's no way that a small tribe led by the K2 Volani kings Caraticus and his brother Togotumnus kicked the Romans ass so bad that they had to run all the way to Gaul. But they did. It's almost like local people have more knowledge about the local area and have the home field advantage. So when the Romans landed in Kent with two legions, they had their asses served on a silver platter by the Britons. Caesar would return a year later, with five legions and defeated the military leader Cassivellaunus. He was replaced with Mandubracius of Trinovans and was placed in command of the Roman tributary for southern Britain. The thing about Britain is that the Romans had next to no prior knowledge about them or their lands before Caesar's campaigns there. The commonly held belief by the Greeks was that the northernmost lands, referred to Hyperborea because it was beyond their god, Borea the North Gods, domain. That domain being the known world. So if the Greeks believed something then the Romans would believe it, but better. Obviously the northern land is the home of giants that live to be 1000 years old and not a barren wasteland of ice and sadness. Being the first Roman to cross the English Channel, Caesar led two legions of soldiers and met the pre-Anglo-Saxon Britons. Surprisingly, they didn't like people coming to their land and claiming that they own it. Having greater numbers, Caesar had his high standing sent home. The Britons would stand triumphant in their victory and never would they be ruled by foreigners from Europe, yeah. Then Caesar rolled up with more people and destroyed them put a puppet king in and went home. So Gaul was thoroughly pacified and would never be an issue again. Until 52 BCE when Vercingetorix the Arverni king led a revolt against the Romans. They were determined to hold their position as Avricum, their last stronghold was razed to the ground, along with its 40,000 inhabitants, by Rome, focusing on the fortified area of Gregovia. In the Auvergne region of France, Vercingetorix led a band of 30,000 Gauls against Caesar's six legions, cavalry, and light infantry. His forces numbering 15 to 30,000 Romans and 5 to 15,000, mostly Adui, tribesmen. When Caesar put the Aryan under siege, Vercingetorix bribed the Adui to attack the supply train. Pro-Romans were put back in charge of the tribe after the attack and they moved in to aid the Romans. Due to a miscommunication between the legions and Caesar, the men attacked with the fort instead of buffing they were supposed to do. On top of that, the Edui arrived to aid the Roman. 
they were confused for an enemy force and were attacked. This was a massive defeat for Caesar as Vercingetorix led a cavalry charge and forced the Romans into a retreat. Caesar would rectify this soon with the last major engagement of the decade. A short battle after saw the loss of the Gallic cavalry to the Romans and the retreat to Alesia. In September of 52 BC, the siege of Alesia took place. The battle is best known for being the prime example of Caesar's strategy in the most brutal engagement of the Gallic War. Led by Julius Caesar, Marcus Antonius, Titus Labianus, and Gaius Trebonius, the Roman built fortifications enclosing the area. The Arverni were led by Vercingetorix, his possible cousin Vercassivoanus, Sedulo, and Commaeus. Roughly 60 to 75,000 Romans were present compared to the fortified area having 80,000 soldiers inside, not including the people. Elysia had twice the number of Avricum, but not all were fit for combat. Many women and children were present in the area when the Romans encircled it. The exact numbers are suspicious as Caesar exaggerated the size of the conflict, but at the end of the month, 25 Roman miles or over 40 kilometers of walls were erected around the area. Directly outside the area, the primary defenses were erected with the two rivers running through the area being 11 Roman miles or 10 modern miles. Word came that Vercassivo Annus, Sedulo, and Commius were leading a force of, what Caesar claimed, to be 248,000 strong relief force. Plutarch claimed that it was closer to 300,000 and Strabo said 400,000. This is called into doubt as Strabo, who was born in 63 BCE would have been 11 at most, and Plutarch was born in 46 CE. Neither really had first-hand experience in totally not trying to get in the good grace of Caesar's successors. Most modern historians believe that the number was closer to under 70,000. Anyway, when Caesar heard this, he ordered the erection of a secondary wall behind them. He had 6 meters, 19 foot, trenches dug about 600 meters, 2,000 feet from the wall. He ordered the construction of a lot, but to simplify greatly, two defensive lines stretching miles around the position were built, one facing into the battle and the other to stop advancing forces. This was because Caesar didn't want to risk a humiliating defeat again and chose to let them starve instead. Limited food forced the Gauls to expel the old, sick and non-combatants. The women and children were also sent with the hopes that they would be taken as prisoners of war. Caesar said no, leaving them trapped between the two walls, the foreigners on one side and their own people on the other, watching them starve. With the relief force a mile from the fortifications, attacks were made on both sides of the fortifications. The exterior forces were defeated and Vercingetorix surrendered his force. Their defeat saw the common folk sold in irons while the nobles were taken as trophies. Until 50 BC, Caesar spent much of his time preventing revolts from the Gallic tribes. This was leading to Caesar's biggest campaign. The Roman Civil War of 49 BCE. This event is no footnote as it played a crucial part in the Roman Republic's last breath. The Roman Civil War, odds are that you have at least heard of it. Not to be confused with the Civil War which Sulla won decades prior, this one sent triples to all corners of the Republic. The Civil War saw the Caesarian faction, prominent figures being Gaius Julius Caesar, Marcus Antonius, Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus, cousin of Marcus Unius Brutus, and Gaius Trebonius to name a few, fight against the Pompeian faction, led by Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, his companions Titus Labinius, Metellus Scipio, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus the Younger, Sextus Pompeius Magnus Bias, and Marcus Unius Brutus, cousin of Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus. This civil war saw families divided and forced into a brutal war. It also saw many similarly named people with long names, so a quick breakdown on how's it going to go. 
Marcus Antonius is Mark Antony. Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus is Brutus the White. The legate Gaius Trebonius is Trebonius. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus is Pompey the Great. Titus Labienius is Labienius. Metellus Scipio is Scipio. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus the Younger is Pompey the Younger, his son. Sextus Pompeius Magnus Pius is Pompey the Pius, his other son. And Marcus Unius Brutus slash Quintus Servilius Cepia Brutus will be referred to as Brutus. And those are just some of them, there are dozens more but they'll be covered as needed. Okay, now that that's covered let's get this thing on the road. Everything began because the Senate back in Rome was getting just a bit nervous about this Caesar guy's popularity and military command. During this campaign in Gaul, Caesar was given consulship of the regions. He had command of Cisalpine Gaul, the land north of the Po River and south of the Alpine Mountains. Illyricum, referring to the Dalmatian coast of Croatia, and Transalpine Gaul, the lands north of the mountains and west of the Rhine. But why would Caesar and Pompey be at each other's throats? Didn't they have the triumvirate with Crassus to prevent these issues? They did. Keyword being did. You see around 55 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus left to fight against Roman's longtime enemy, the Parthians of the Persian lands. With him was his son Publius Licinius Crassus, as well as Gaius Cassius Longinus, the brother-in-law of Brutus. Marcus and Publius Crassus perished during the campaign in 53 BCE. Good for this story as I don't have to spend time differentiating them, but bad for Caesar and Pompey as the triumvirate lost one third of its members. This was after Pompey's fourth wife Julius Caesar, Caesar's daughter has passed away a year before at the age of 22. As the Gallic Wars drew to a close. Caesar's popularity was reaching a level that nearly eclipsed Pompey's. If you know anything about Romans, it's that they have egos the size of the Roman prides frailer than a ceramic hammer. Is someone becoming more popular than the senators? That's not going to happen. Odds were that if Caesar ran for consul, he'd easily win. It was around this time, 55 to 52 BC, with it getting particularly bad between 53 to 52 BC, that anarchic political violence swept the city. Men such as Gaius Cassius Longinus and Titus and the Ismaila lead violent gangs through the city of Rome. It was during this political breakdown, in 55 BCE that Julius Caesar saw the slaves carrying her husband's bloody toga and when in distress induced premature labor. The child passed away and Julia followed, being in poor health from the birth. In 52 BCE Pompey was forced to take sole consulship of Rome to re-establish order to the city. He did so without convening the electoral senate. Kind of big issue if someone's claiming to have the republic democratic ideals at heart, while also supplanting the regular process when rapid action is needed. Funny how that goes. Getting back to Caesar, one senator by the name of Marcus Claudius Marcellus, wanted to curb Caesar's power. Saying that when Caesar defeated Vercingetorix and his forces, his task of quelling the rebellion in Gaul was completed and he had reached the end of his command. As well, his application for consulship in absentia, or not physically present, was voided as he could be in Rome. The Senate disagreed and extended his term to the 1st of March, 50 BCE. Well, 50 BCE rolled around and things went downhill fast. A year prior, Pompey had been critical to rejecting the proposal, now he was blocking every attempt made by Caesar for consulship. As long as Caesar had command of his provinces and his army, no consul for him. Despite the adamancy of his proposal, the Senate didn't share his sentiment. Senator Gaius Scribonius Curio the Younger held the position that it would only be fair for Caesar to yield command if Pompey did so in turn. Seems perfectly reasonable and fair, so obviously it failed. Despite being passed by a 370-20 vote on December 50 BC, 
It was rejected by Pompey and the consul of the time, Gaius Claudius Marcellus. They had a golden opportunity to prevent disaster but Pompey wouldn't yield. It's not like he couldn't tell his legions that he was temporarily stepping down from command and would call them up in the case of Caesar withdrawing from the agreement. But with Romigo rules supreme. Anyway, after Pompey and Marcellus vetoed the proposal, Claudius Marcellus spread the word that Caesar planned to seize Rome and put Pompey in charge of defending the city. So now, I want you to picture that you are Caesar. Having just finished a near decade long guerrilla war with the Gallic tribes, a war in which has seen your eldest die due to complications and her giving birth to your grandson, as well as your close friend Crassus dying after being outplayed by the Parthians in the guild. Finally, your quote, unquote ally Pompey demands that you are to relinquish your command and provinces. A blatant insult of doing so would mean another triumph stolen by the senator's machinations. If you were Caesar, would you be willing to take that insult after decades of service and another denial of a medal of valor for your service? Yet Caesar did not declare war over that. On the 1st of January, 49 BC, Caesar sent messengers to inform the senate that Caesar would be willing to give up his command of Transalpine Gaul. France and Switzerland areas, in exchange for retaining command of two legions and being allowed to retain his triumph and run for consul. Considering that civil war is on the horizon, it will be reasonable to think that any sane people would try to avoid it. All Caesar wanted was to retain two of his ten legions, keep the triumph he worked for, and the opportunity to try to be consul. Perhaps retaining command of 10,400 soldiers and 1,200 cavalry was too much, but the finer details could have been negotiated. Any reasonable people would agree. If they had an issue with the two legions encounter with the half legion or two legions worth of cavalry, anything to prevent a bloody war. The issue was that the Senate was not reasonable. Senator Marcus Porcius Gato Eutysensis of the former Carthaginian city Unica, or Cato the Younger rejected any discussion unless Caesar was physically present in the Roman Senate. To do so would strip Caesar of military command and thus, his triumph. On the 7th of January, 49 BC, Caesar was sent an ultimatum. Leave his post and come to Rome or be labeled as an enemy of Rome. Days later, Caesar's permission to stand for senator in absentia was revoked and his replacement for Transalpine Gaul was appointed. Despite numerous rejections by senators, even vetoes which would have voided the proposals, they were ignored and the Pompeian leaning senate declared Senatus Consul Tumultimum, the final decree of the senate. This was similar to a state of emergency act under martial law, but it didn't strip Roman citizens of the right to a trial or change the magistrate's powers. The final act was meant to be enacted to preserve the Republic as it was done so during Sulla's command or during the Catiline Conspiracy. The final act gave the consuls dictatorial powers to ensure the safety of Rome. The act meant that any arbitration or discussion was concluded and the only means left were violent measures. With democracy put on hold. The Caesarian leaning senators fled the city to Caesar's camp across the Rubicon. The Rubicon was a small river that denoted where Cisalpine Gaul ended and Rome proper began. On the 10th or 11th of January 49 BC, it is said that Caesar declared quote the die has been cast. Historians debate if it was as Suetonius claim was, alii acta a, the die is cast in Latin or as Plutarch said was a reference to the poet Menander, and of Phil Cabos, or let the die be thrown. Despite this, Caesar's writings do not mention the Rubicon so hood exact thoughts at the time are a mystery. What was certain was the Gallic legions who served Rome. Of the Caesarian loyalists and the Pompeian loyalists, each force followed who they thought was deserving of their loyalty. Whether it was Rome or Caesar. For them and loyal to Caesar, he made it a point to show how the Senate had violated the rights of the tribunes by annulling their vetoes, 
listing the injustices done to him by his rivals, and the betrayal by Pompey. Finally, argue that this and its final act should only be enacted when the city was actually in danger. Of the Romans, many were still undecided on their allegiance in the civil war. Marcus Claudius chose neutrality as Pompey was meant to defend the city, not lead them to war. Brutus made an unusual choice. In his youth, Marcus Unius Brutus the Elder, his father, was put to death by Pompey. This is because he joined Marcus Lepidus in the insurrection to restore the power stripped by Sulla during the dictator's reign. This was exasperated by Consul Quintus Lutatius Catulus Capitolinus who blocked a constitutional reform. A rebellion was forced and it saw the two fail. Despite Brutus the Elder surrendering and being allowed to retire to a small town, Pompey sent Geminius to murder the man, Dick. Brutus's mother served low. A half-sister to Cato of Unica, was one of Caesar's known lovers. By all accounts, he should have sided with Caesar, if not to avenge his father's murder then to side with a good possible father. Without the bodies to test the DNA, it can only be speculated, but there is a substantial chance that the 15-year-old Caesar had an affair with the 16-year-old Servla, even though she was married to Brutus the Elder for two to three years at the time. This is possible as Servula was known to be Caesar's favorite mistress. It was also likely that Brutus the White was another one of Caesar's bastards as it was said that he had a close relationship with them and viewed them as like a son to Caesar. But historians believe otherwise because they are dumb and the exact nature is subject to speculation. I like to think it's true because 1. Caesar would sleep with whoever he could and probably had a gaggle of bastards. And, two, it would add to the whole Greek tragedy vibe that this story has. Shockingly, Brutus sided with his mother's half-brother Cato the Younger, and joined the Pompeians. As did Titus Labinius, siding with Pompey over Caesar due to either an issue with Caesar claiming his glory or an existing loyalty to Pompey. Now Caesar had noticeably fewer men compared to the Pompeian loyalists but was able to quickly capture four cities, spreading the word that Caesar had done so back to Rome on the 17th of January, 49 BCE. According to Plutarch, upon hearing this, Pompey quote issued an edict in which he recognized a state of civil war, ordered all the senators to follow him, and, declared that he would regard as a partisan of Caesar anyone who remained behind. Wow! Really swaying those on the fence to side with you. Now, understandably many politicians who were pro-Caesarian or non-aligned at the time fled the city. This is because, as was the case for Sulla's civil war nearly three decades prior saw the mass executions of anyone not loyal to the person in command of the city at the time. Near the end of the month, Caesar and Pompey tried again to negotiate the issue. The terms proposed by Caesar were that they were to return to their provinces, Gaul for Caesar and Gaspani for Pompey, and disband their forces. Pompey agreed on the terms that they seek arbitration in the Senate. Obviously, Caesar rejected this counteroffer as it would rid him of his upper hand while also putting him in the needed distance for the senators to attack him as well as revoke his right to triumph. Odds were that if he walked into the Senate, the Pompeian senators would have stabbed him on the spot. Hopefully, that never happens. Ha ha. So Caesar continued to advance and upon meeting Quinus Minucius Thermus at the city of Icudum. Quinus's five cohorts, totaling about 2,400 people deserted. With them deserted Caesar's forces were able to capture the region of Pisnum, Pompey's familial origin. Definitely a blow to his morale. The thing with Roman captured cities are that they tended to be looted, but Caesar denied it as they weren't conquering, but liberating. This boosted the Caesarian popularity at the expense of the Pompeians. The next month saw the relinquishment of Asculum and an increase of combatants to Caesar's forces. The first major resistance that Caesar faced is when he reached the city of Corifinium, garrisoned by one Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, 
the man who the Pompeians placed in command of Gaul to replace Caesar. Caesar suggested that Ahenobarbus retreat to join Pompey's forces, but was rejected. Ahenobarbus declared that reinforcements were on the way and that he would hold until then. But that's not true. The thing was that Ahenobarbus sent word to Pompey saying that Corfinium was being attacked by Caesar and they needed help. Pompey's response was that no help was coming. After the week of the city being under siege, Ahenobarbus was arrested by his own men after he was caught trying to flee the city. Along with him, 50 senators and equestrians, were similar to knights and ranked below senators but above plebeians. They were all released by Caesar and the local magistrate, similar to the mayor of the area handing over 6 million sesterte, equal to 13.2 million USD to Caesar. Ahenobarbus intended to use it to pay his men, which Caesar did, giving Ahenobarbus his men their earned wage and in return only asking for an oath of their loyalty, which they gave. As his forces marched on the Adriatic coast, the eastern coast of Italy, he ordered his men to refrain from plundering and pillaging the cities. This act of clemency helped garner support from the masses and limit the chances that they would be turned on. While this was happening, Pompey realized that he didn't have the forces on the peninsula to fight Caesar and retreated to the city of Brindisi U, modern-day Brindisi. Planning to sail to the lands of Achaia, Epirus, and Macedonia, the lands currently known as Greece, and raise an army, completely abandoning his post as the defender of the city of Rome. To travel, he commandeered. Military talk for stole dozens of merchant ships to transport his men across the waters. Caesar and good forces arrived on the 7th of March but Pompey refused to negotiate. Caesar tried to block the ship's egress by erecting earthworks but Pompey fled with most of his men and all the ships in the harbor. Without any immediate threat to their safety, Caesar marched into Rome and called a synod meeting of all those who had stayed in the city. The meeting was called on the 1st of April and the turnout was poor. Despite this, he requested a delegation be sent by the Senate to negotiate with Pompey. It was agreed upon but there were no volunteers. After he called a concilium plebis, the People's Council, and promised 300 sesterce and a guarantee of the grain supply, but the reaction was muted. An often overlooked part of war is the expenses. Any war. No matter the size will be expensive to a degree. Much of the conflict so far had been financed personally by Caesar, so with the treasury now under his power, he had the coinage to continue without bankrupting himself. He told the Senate, or what was left, that he intended to use the coffers to fight Pompey. The issue was that he intended to use the Aerarium Sanctum or the special funds that existed to defend against Gallic attacks to deal with Pompey. This was justified as he had permanently dealt with the issue, in his own words. Senator L. Cassilius Metellus tried to veto act, but was ignored or threatened to withdraw. So now both sides' leaders were hypocrites as Pompey was tasked with defending Roman had fled and Caesar claimed to defend the rights of the tribunes and had just threatened or disregarded their vote. Having taken the treasury, Caesar took control of 15,000 gold bars, 30,000 silver bars, and 30 million sister take coins. Which added up to, a lot of money. With the money issue dealt with, Caesar went to Hispania while leaving Mark Antony in charge of Italia. Before he could enter Hispano with his legions, the city of Massilia, modern Marseille Monaco, told him no. In command of the city was the brave Ahenobarbus. Despite having abandoned his position last time Caesar rolled up, he was put in charge of the city militia force. Now Caesar didn't want to stick around and deal with Ahenobarbus again so he and Legio 17, 18, and 19 put the city under siege. Gaius Trebonius was to oversee the troops and Decimus Brutus to deal with the naval forces due to his skills there. Heading off to Hispania, the siege began. A brief addition to the siege is that when the battering rams had touched the gate, the siege had officially started. 
Caesar focused on Hispania as Pompey's generals Lucius Sophranius and Marcus Petrius held command of the peninsula. Drawing near Ilerda, modern Lida, Caesar's six legions, battle-worn, and under strength, after losing 700 men, forced Afranius and Petrius to retreat southward to join up with Marcus Turandius Varro. They were encircled before they could join up and surrendered their five legions to Caesar, pushing to the learned man Varroa position, in his bonnet ulterior. Varro surrendered and Quintus Cassius Longinus, brother or cousin of Cassius was placed in command of Hispano with four legions of defectors or legions that surrendered to the Caesarian army. At least they were still employed. Having wrapped up Hispania, he marched back to Massilia to see how things went. Meanwhile, Gaius Scribonius Curio the Younger, son of Gaius Scribonius Curio the Elder, lead and forced to take control of Sicily and the province of Africa, modern Tunisia. Curio the Younger was rumored to have had an affair with Mark Antony in his youth. He also had two kids Gaius Scribonius Curio Major and Gaius Scribonius Curio Minor. He was the last senator to try to reach a compromise between the two parties. Caesar gave Curia four legions and 1,000 Gallic cavalry to secure the grain supply as the province of Africa, Tunisia to Libya, and the Empire of Egypt supplied Rome with a large portion of their grains. Sicily was captured and Cato the Younger fled the island. Moving to Africa, Curio was up against the king of Numidia Juba I, and consul of Africa Publius Ashus Verus. Their initial battle was Utica the birthplace of Cato the Younger. The Caesarians defeated Varus and Juba I. The second battle of the Bagratis River did not turn out so well. Curio was beaten by the joint Numidia Roman forces. Choosing to die a soldier than live in disgrace, he fought to his last dying breath. Few of his men escaped on the ships, with the remaining seeking fair treatment under Varus. He agreed but Juba I did not. Juba had all but the most important prisoners of war executed on the spot. The remaining ones were taken back to Numidia to be executed or imprisoned. Pompey recognized him king of Numidia for his help. Returning to Rome in December of 49 BC, Caesar contacted Marcus Emilius Lepidus, the praetor and pontifex Maximus, to grant him the position of dictator. The official title was Magistrate Populi or Master of the People. This was for two reasons. Holding a position of power, leading an army, holding command of a province, praetorship, or similar grants a citizen imperium. With imperium, Romans hold the power to act but with a modicum of impunity. Now with Magistrate Populi, Caesar conducted the consulship selection, in which he ran. He also recalled almost every senator exiled for disagreeing with Pompey in 52 BCE. Titus Aeneas Milo was excluded from this because fuck him in particular. Titus Milo was exiled for his bodyguards killing Pulcher in 52 BCE. Caesar also returned the rights of the children that had their political rights stripped during the proscription of Sulla. Which is good of him. Convenient that he had his birthright stripped during Sulla's proscription but that's probably just a coincidence and not a slight against the dead dictator. Caesar was elected as consul alongside his god friend Publius Servilius Isauricus, who is best known for being the father of Gaius Octavius' first wife, Octavius being the great nephew of Caesar. Isauricus mostly left Caesar to act as he pleases. Now that Caesar didn't have to worry about his tribute or command being legally stripped, he relinquished his title of Magistrate Populi, 11 days after receiving the title. He continued his pursuit of Pompey into the land of the Grisai, Greece. Traveling to Brindisium, the land closest to Greece, Caesar debated how to best traverse the waters as Pompey had a fleet of sailors under the command of Bipulus defending the Adriatic Sea's mouth. Deciding to set sail, Caesar crossed on the Roman calendar's 8th of January, 48 BCE. I say that as it was likely late autumn due to the drift of the days. 
Roman days had four months that added 31 days, seven months with 29 days, and February being 28 days. 355 days? A lunar-based calendar. But the Romans had a brilliant strategy to add days in February to make sure that festivals fell on the appropriate days. This was decided by the Pontifex Maximus. Hopefully no one abused this to lengthen his term in office. Like Caesar for example. Getting back on track, Caesar's crossing in autumn caught the Pompeians with their trousers dropped as they had settled in for the winter, leaving the ships unmanned. Bipulus did manage to capture some of the ships returning to Brindisium, leaving the seven legions without a supply chain of food and stranded. Nevertheless, Caesar marched his forces into Apollonia with little resistance, allowing him to secure a foothold in a base of operations. The Pompeian supply lines were primarily focused around the area of Diarachium, modern Doris Albania. Caesar attempted to capture it but retreated when confronted by Pompey's larger forces. At least he's not stupid enough to attack an army larger than his without a strategy to win. So he waited roughly three months and on April 10th, Mark Antony arrived with the rest of the legions. Feeling confident in his odds, Caesar leaves his forces to capture Diarachium, and was repelled. What he didn't realize was that Pompey had the high ground. So he tried plan B, siege the area, and Pompey broke out. Right now, Caesar was 0 for 2 with Pompey on Diarachium forcing a retreat at Thessaly. But it wasn't peaches and cream for the Pompeians as several of his overconfident allies accused him of prolonging the war to extend his command. They thought that he asked to strike now and in the fighting instead of prolonging the inevitable. With reinforcements from Scipio's Syrian forces, Pompey sought a decisive battle with Caesar. Pompey was led from his strong position by Caesar and the two armies met at the plains of Pharsalus. The battle raged on and Labianius attempted to flank Caesar's reserve line and failed. This allowed Caesar's veterans to defeat Pompey's infantry and force a retreat and a loss as supporters. Many approached Caesar's camp searching for a pardon and were welcomed in. His goal wasn't to execute the Pompeians if they sought a pardon. He wished to retain his position and have his triumph. One of those who sought the pardon was one Marcus Brutus, who was welcomed by his definitely not father. Around October, after the battle, Caesar was declared magistrate populi again, this time serving the full year limit. Why? Not sure, but it might have been that his power as consul was ending and he wanted to continue his war without being forced to run for office during the crisis and give up his imperium. Now Pompey's war council was not looking good, several major figures had fled to Caesar's camp and they were hiding in Asia Minor. Their only hope was to see if the pharaoh of Egyptus, the boy King Ptolemy XIII would aid them. The thing about Egyptus is that the family tree of the Ptolemaic dynasty was closer to a braided rope than a tree. Half-siblings would marry their cousins or each other, then kill them after they had children to ensure that they were the sole rulers. If you want me to cover the messy family tree, let me know. Brief rundown, Ptolemy XII Thaletes, or the Flutus was deposed from his throne by his daughter Berenice IV Epiphana. This was a year after Ptolemy XII heavily bribed Caesar to prevent the annexation of Egypt and recognize him as a legitimate pharaoh. Technically Ptolemy XII was the bastard of Ptolemy IX Soter II and some unknown mother. Rome recognized him as the legitimate ruler, at a heavy cost to his country. He did this because his uncle Ptolemy had willed it that Rome would get Egypt if there was no Ptolemies left ruling Egypt. Ptolemy's brother wasn't part of the deal and Ptolemy, king of Cyprus's lands were annexed by Rome. This caused unrest and Berenice IV Epiphania was placed on the throne. Ptolemy now was a deposed king residing at Pompey's villa. Berenice IV then married Archelaus, son of Mithridates IV, and ruled Egypt. To Ptolemy, it looked like his kingdom was moving along without him. 
so Ptolemy XII had to pay the Pompeian supporter Aulus Gabinius, 10,000 talents. Each talent of precious metal weighing 27 kilograms or 60 pounds. That's 27 tons or 29.76 US tons. Gabinius led his men and executed Berenice IV and Archelaus for usurping the throne. Ptolemy XII died in 51 BCE and in Rome executed his will. The Senate was busy with their own issues so Palm V was left in charge of it. The will stated that Cleopatra VII Theophilopater would rule with her brother Ptolemy XIII Philopater. I say that so you can get an image of what Palm V was doing when he fled to Egypt. Ptolemy XII had been a close ally of his and he had guaranteed that Ptolemy XIII ascended to the throne. Egypt had also just concluded a civil war as well which saw the 21-year-old Kofara Cleopatra VII flee and her sister Arsinoe IV claim the seat of Kofara. Initially, when Ptolemy XIII heard Pompey's plea, he accepted. Unfortunately for the Roman, Ptolemy's eunuch Pothinus, and rhetoric teacher Theodotus of Caius told him otherwise. The exact words are not known but it can be gleaned from the outcome that they said his death would placate Caesar. On the 29th of September, 48 BC, Ptolemy's guardian Achilles and Roman soldier Lucius Septimius executed Pompey in hopes of pleasing Caesar. Surprisingly, it failed. When Caesar entered Egypt, the boy king presented the severed head of Pompey. Disgusted by this act against a Roman citizen, Caesar ordered the body be located and Pompey be given a Roman funeral. They may have been enemies, but Ptolemy XIII had just ordered the murder of a Roman citizen. Scholars debate on if his reaction was because his son-in-law was executed or if it was because he had his just revenge stolen by a foreigner. But given how he pardoned many of those who sought it, I personally believe the latter. He may be petty, but he's not a prick. At least, that much of a prick. We do know that if it were not for the intervention of Cleopatra VII, it is likely that Egypt would have been destroyed. She managed to sway Caesar from dismantling the dynasty and instead return her to her throne, with her other brother, Ptolemy XIV serving as a figurehead to her actual authority. He agreed and had Pothinus executed for suggesting his plan to Ptolemy. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to Cleopatra. Now Cleopatra wasn't stupid, quite the opposite actually. Much of the modern perception of her is based on the writings of her adversaries, designed to portray her as vain and conniving. When you imagine Cleopatra, it is likely that it would be a lady in lavish clothes and expensive accessories decorating her scarcely covered physique. But this again is because of her enemies slandering her legacy. Without going too much into it, Cleopatra VII spoke many languages and provided reforms, general services, and social overhauls. On her linguistic skills, Plutarch wrote, quote, Pleasure also came with the tone of her voice, and her tongue was like a many stringed instrument. She could turn in easily to whichever language she wished since she conversed with few barbarians entirely through an interpreter, and she gave her decisions herself to most of them, including Ethiopians, Troglodytes, Hebrews, Arabians, Syrians, Medes, and Parthians. Quite skilled, so it was of little surprise that she caught the attention of Caesar. Remember that Caesar had a thing of comparing himself with Alexander the May and Cleopatra was the descendant of Alexander the Great's possible half-brother Ptolemy Soter. But he was a foreign general in Egypt and this was used to rouse unease in the city. So he read from Ptolemy XII's will and bequeathed Ptolemy XIV and Arsinoe for dominion of Rhodes. With things calming down. Caesar attended the banquet hosted by the current rulers Ptolemy XIII and his unexiled sister Cleopatra VII. As this happened, Caesar was made aware of a plot against him by Achilles and Pothinus. He had his army encircle the feast and try to detain them. Achilles escaped but Pothinus did not and was executed. Achilles rallied Pompey's army and aimed them at Caesar's. 
completely glossing over the fact that they had their leader murdered. The palace was put a siege and, severely outnumbered, set up to defend with the pharaoh Ptolemy as his hostage. As this happened, Arsinoe escaped with her tutor Ganymedes to join Achilles. She proclaimed herself as the queen of Egypt and had Achilles executed for disagreeing with her new plan. The water to the palace was poisoned by Ganymede and Caesar released Ptolemy in an attempt to weaken Arsino's forces. But that failed as they decided that Cleopatra and Caesar were the biggest issues. It was also around this time that Caesar found out that sex has consequences as Cleopatra was pre-Gagon and with his son, nicknamed Caesarian or Little Caesar, Pizza Pizza. The siege was not to last as the Prince of Pergamon. Pergamum Turkey, arrived accompanied by Caesar's reinforcements. They secured the lighthouse of Alexandria and the pathway connecting it to the palace. With the combined forces, Ptolemy XIII was forced into retreat and drowned in the Nile River after his ship capsized. Ironic, given that he had died in the lifeblood of his kingdom. Caesar collected the body of the young pharaoh and wanted to present the deceased to Cleopatra. It was likely that she greeted the Roman general dressed in clothes bearing the symbol of Isis, otherwise known as Aeside, translating to mean the queen of the throne. An obvious symbolic connection there. The siege was not without its losses as, during the fighting, the legendary library of Alexandria caught fire, resulting in the loss of many of the works. To celebrate their victory, Cyprus was gifted to the queen and her new co-pharaoh Ptolemy XIV Philobator. Despite the fact that they were, officially, co-rulers, the twelve-year-old pharaoh Ptolemy XIV held little command. Given how quickly Caesar moved on the quail issues previously, it was shocking that he remained in Egypt for several months. Officially it was to secure Cleopatra's rule. But realistically it was so he can relax and ride along the Nile with his pregnant lover. So obviously Farnes is a second of Pontus would use this time to reclaim the independence of his land. The kingdom of Pontus at its height covered the lands from most of Turkey, southern Ukraine with all of Crimea, the western Caucasus coast, and small pockets of cities on the coast of modern Bulgaria and Romania. The land was conquered by Pompey in 63 BCE. Pharnaces too was able to seize the lands of Pontus, the northeastern lands of Turkey, bordering the Black Sea, because Pompey had stripped the troops primarily located there to fight Caesar. Without them, Pharnaces too was able to reclaim much of his dynasty's historic land. Gnaeus Domitius Calvinus, the governor of Roman Asia, modern western Turkey, tried to repel the king of the Crimean Bosporan kingdom's attack Nicopolis in December 48 BC, resulting in Pharnaces' victory over Calvinus's inexperienced men. Caesar left Egypt shortly afterward, leaving three legions under the command of a freedman to maintain Cleopatra's rule. Shortly after, she bore her eldest son, Ptolemy Caesar, or as he would have been called in his native Koine Greek, Ptolemos, Philobator, Philometer, Caesar, Caesarian, Myconic Greek isn't Greek but it roughly meant Ptolemy father loving, mother loving, Caesar, little Caesar. If Caesar had an issue with Ptolemy 15 bearing his name, he never said anything about it, meaning that Caesarian was the son as he didn't deny that claim. Back to Pharnaces too, Romans portrayed him as a cruel man who castrated captured legionaries. Upon the meeting of the two, Pharnaces attempted to parley but was continually stonewalled by Caesar. He gave simple terms, withdraw from the lands, return what was stolen and release the prisoners. This would defeat the whole purpose of the campaign so Pharnaces said no. Meeting at the hill outside of Zayla, modern Zyl, Turkey, the battle began. After a brief confusion amongst the Romans. Caesar's men forced Pharnaces' men off their hill and the Caesarian forces broke through their right flanks, causing the rout of their forces. Pharnaces managed to retreat to his kingdom and was promptly assassinated. Apparently they were fine with his war when he was winning, 
but losing, unacceptable. This fight was a noticeably short affair. In one of the writings on the war, he is noted as having said the famous, Vinny, VD, VC. Which meant I came, I saw, I conquered. This served two purposes as it proved the might of Caesar for being able to defeat the king so quickly and mock Pompey for earning his fame defeating such an easy adversary. Meanwhile, back in Rome, stuff was still happening. One Publius Cornelius de Labula, was the tribune of the plebs for the year 47 BC and tried to have a bill passed. The bill aimed to abolish debt, partly due to the not insubstantial amount that he owed. Acting leader Mark Antony was advised against it, the Senate voted to support it. Things turned violent and Caesar would have to clean up when he returned to Rome. Antony may have been more willing to use violence as he believed that De Labella was sleeping with his wife. Then Caesar's 9th and 10th legions, primarily composed of veterans, mutinied so Mark Antony had to try to resolve it. Followed by political violence in the streets forcing the Senate to pass a final act. But there was no one in Rome who had any authority to enforce it. When Anthony did return, there was already a substantial loss of life, tanking Anthony's reputation. To top it all off, Metellus Scipio along with Labianus went to Hispania ulterior to convince one of the governors Caesar appointed to defect. Back to Caesar, when he returned to Rome in late 47 BC, he was greeted by Cicero who asked for a pardon and was granted. Cicero ran the odds and without Pompey, his faction couldn't win. Which is pretty fair, Pompey was the figurehead of his faction, and without him, there would have been a power vacuum that his generals would try to fill. But while in Rome, Caesar ran and won his fifth consulship with Lepidus as his co-consul. In Campania, a mutiny arose in Caesar's and future historian Gaius Salus's Crispus, to try and resolve it. It failed when the mob tried to murder him, so once again, Caesar had to try to resolve the issue. Definitely not plagiarizing Alexander the mostly decent speech when his men mutinied, he spoke to the men nearing Rome. He told the veterans that they would be immediately relieved of duty and would be granted their land and retirement bonus. He also made a point to refer to him as queer rights, roughly meaning citizen, instead of legionari, legionaries. Most were shocked by the blasé nature of their dismissal, many pleaded to continue serving him. After falsely considering it, he agreed with the ringleaders being placed in dangerous or otherwise risky positions during his next campaign. Returning to Rome, Caesar was left with the matter of the Pompeian estate. Time for economic policies, yeah. Or more specifically, the estate and property of the deceased are those still unpardoned. And on the matter of Don Abella's debt cancellation bill, he declined it, saying that with the amount he owed, the bill would make him the chief beneficiary. Then with the estates, he was supposed to have sold at rates that his allies were disappointed in. Hinting at the need for a quick injection of money. He didn't stay long as he was needed in Africa. Before he left, Cicero told him that he had lost confidence in Antony's command, but not Donabella's. This may seem unnecessarily rude to Antony, but it was not without its merits. Antony lacked the linguistic sense and political understanding that Caesar had. If I was to define Caesar in one word, it would be crafty. Antony would be, himbo. Good man, but a few sticks short of a bundle. But back to Caesar. Gathering his men in Lilibem, modern Marsala, Sicily. Amongst his staff, he appointed a man from the family of Scipio. This is because of a myth that no Scipio could be defeated in Africa. And the Romans are nothing if not superstitious. He departed on the 25th of December. 47 BCE with multiple ships carrying his six legions. Things went pear-shaped when a storm got them when sailing, leaving him with three and one-half legions, in addition to 150 cavalry to land at the ancient city of Hadriandum, modern-day Hamam, Tunisia. It is said but not known if true, 
that Caesar fell on the sands upon landing, but played it off having said that he now had a hold of Africa. I feel it is important to add that Africa was the name of the province of Rome along the southern coast of the Mediterranean, the land south and slightly west of Italy. Having a Scipio was important as Caesar was up against Metellus Scipio and King Juba won with fewer men than they had fielded. His men were fighting against King Juba of Namibia's 120 war elephants. Have you ever seen an elephant? They are massive and can crush a man easily. Comparatively, most people in that era never saw animals unless they were locally available. Now try to imagine how the average soldier felt trying to fight that massive beast. Setting up base at Raspina, modern monster Tunisia, after Hadriumtum refused to surrender. Sending someone to Sicily to send reinforcements, he tried to make do with his inexperienced legionaries. Given that they were inexperienced, he had foraging parties were repelled by the combined Numidian, Pompeian forces. Lady Fortuna shown on Caesar as Bacchus II of East Mauritania, modern Morocco and Algiers, and Roman mercenary Publius Sicius, declared war on the Namibian king. The Berber king was not acting on Caesar's orders and was seizing the opportunity to weaken his neighbor. As well, Caesar received 800 Gallic cavalry and two legions with a large supply of food. Putting user to siege. Veteran legionnaires defected to Caesar and reinforcements from the mutineers of Campania. The siege of Usida was unlikely to fall any time soon so Caesar raided the food stores and left to conquer Thapsus. Thapsus went south pretty quick for the Pompeians despite having more men. Plutarch says that Caesar felt an epileptic episode and needed to rest, so his men attacked the Pompeian lines and inflicted heavy casualties. 10,000 Pompeians to 50 Caesarian was a good rate. The Pompeian War Council was able to mostly escape, with Scipio choosing to take his life after his ship was intercepted by Caesar's forces. King Juba made a suicide pact with legionary Marcus Petrius to die by single combat as it was preferable to capture by Rome. Among the Pompeian Council, Labienius had fled to Hispania to join Pius Pompey. Shortly before Thapsus fell, the city of Utica was defeated in April 46 BCE. Cato the Younger wasn't present for the battle but held the city. He supposedly communicated with his outnumbered men and at dinner. He then drew a sword and opened your stomach up. A doctor ran in and saw him disemboweling himself. Cato died before he could be stopped. With the main opposition in Africa dealt with, Caesar traveled to the Pompeian supporter cities and issued punitive fines. You think that will keep him busy, but not too busy to have an affair with a queen? He, met, with Anomora of West Mauritania for a while. Historian Suetonius held her in the same regard as Cleopatra, showing that she was of a fairly distinguished lineage. Caesar left in June and returned to Rome in July. With the Pompeian forces in tatters, Caesar petitioned the Senate to hold his triumphs. Not a triumph, or two triumphs, or even five, but for consecutive triumphs. One for his exploits in Gaul, another for the defeat of Ptolemy XIII, one for the victory against Pharnaces II, and a last one for defeating Juba I of Namibia making sure to portray it as a victory against Juba, a Namibian, and not Scipio, a Roman. The festival lasted from the 21st of September to the 2nd of October. I'll cover triumphs in more detail some later time but a triumph is a military celebration entirely funded by the triumphant general. It was to inform Roman citizens of what happened during the campaigns, a show of the spoils of war and definitely not sacrifice the captured nobles to Jupiter. They just ritually executed them at the foot of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, every time. As he traveled in his triumph card in a pure purple robe and gold laurel leaf crown, he was preceded by 72 lictors. Lictors being civil servants who are attending to the consul or dictator and carry a bundle of sticks around an axe known as a fasces. 
This is unusual as consuls were allowed to have 12 lictors and dictators having 24. Caesar had three times as he was dictator three times. Most people might have an issue with it but the legionaries didn't. Caesar donated to each one at least 16 years wage, with more for the centurions and officers. After the celebrations and a song sung about the bald fucker returning to Rome so the citizens should hire their wives. After the festivities were done, Caesar took a legion of veterans and headed to go to Hispania. He'd have taken more, but most of the other veterans had retired. Upon arrival, Caesar took over from the generals he had stationed to siege the area. The fighting was noticeably crueler as the Pompeian supporters were treated as rebels and in turn, suspected Caesarian supporters and their families were massacred. This happened at Tigua near Cordoba, causing a massive mutiny in the Pompeian army and forcing Pompey the Younger to retreat. They were pursued in Melinda and Hispania ulterior and forced to fight. Assisting Pompey the Younger was Titus Labinius. The fighting took place in March of 47 BCE and it was thanks to the Legia 10 piercing the right flank that caused the rout of the Pompeians. Labinius attempted to stop the rout but was unsuccessful and perished during the fight. Pompey the Younger escaped but was beheaded not long after. Sextus Pompeius Magnus Pius managed to escape to flee to Syria and stage a small revolt. But with Pompey the Younger and Labanius dead, the civil war is over. Now that the war was over, the next battle was the political field. He declared a 50 day of giving thanks and had Liberator added to his name as well as a temple dedicated to liberty. The next few months saw further titles added to his official title as the Senate wanted to retain his favor due to his popularity amongst the citizens. An ivory statue of Caesar was added next to the kings and at the temple of Quirinus. Quirinus held a high status as according to Plutarch in Life of Romulus, the founder of Rome once disappeared and reappeared to one Perculus Julius to tell him that the gods took him and that he was now the god Quirinus. If Romulus and Quirinus were always one being or as they were separated and then rejoined is debated by scholars, but regardless of the fact, Caesar having your statue placed inside the god's temple was obvious. The month of Quinctus was renamed Julius and a temple to Caesar's mercy was built. Lastly, Imperator and Parents Patria was appended to his name. So if you're keeping track, Liberator Imperator Gaius Julius Caesar Parents Patria with Divus added on with the cult of Caesar following his death. A special knot throne was also added to the Senate for him. Next, he had established colonies for his veterans to settle and granted Latin rights to many loyal Gallic towns. This gave them all the general benefits of Roman citizens as well as the right to apply for full citizenship. So happy veterans and many thousands of new possible citizens added to Rome who had Caesar to thank. Yet Caesar made a blunder in October of 45 BCE when he got the right to triumph for ending the civil war. This was less popular as it was not a war against enemies of Rome, but citizens. He also granted the rights to his legates, Quintus Pedius, his nephew or a grandnephew, and the unrelated Quintus Fabius Maximus. Lastly, he had allies appointed to the seat of consul hours after the previous one died. He also planned more military excursions against the Parthians of Persia and the Dacians of southeast modern Romania, some point in the next few years. Let's cover the last section about Caesar. The thing with Caesar was that he had pardoned almost all of his enemies, creating a fair bit of goodwill around the matter. Though that goodwill was slightly tempered by his fifth triumph for ending the civil war. Most found it to be in poor taste as were Roman legions that were slaughtered not random barbarians. Though it is important to note that in September of 45 BC, Caesar updated his will as the previous one was nearing a decade old, and willed that much of his estate would pass to son-in-law Pompey and Julia. So, yeah, not going to happen. The most important part that was appended to the document was that Augustus Octavius, the grandson of his elder sister, 
Julia Aceus Balbus. Her daughter Ada Balba married Gaius Octavius and Ada Octavia the Younger, Mark Antony's fourth wife, and Augustus Octavian, referred to by historians as Octavian for convenience sake. The will also stipulated that should Octavian refuse or perish before Caesar, Brutus Albinius would be his heir. It also stated that a gift of coinage was to be made to Rome upon his death. I'll cover the rest in time but I feel I need to add this here. The will made no mention of Caesarian or any bastards that Caesar had sired. Why is not certain, but a good reason I heard was if he legitimized Caesarian, it would be akin to annexing Egypt as he was Cleopatra's only child at the time. Meaning that any lands held by Caesar would go to Caesarian, and this new Roman citizen would also be the pharaoh of Egypt. It might also seem like Caesar was trying to start up a dynasty, which he very well could have been, but that's not the point. Caesar also had a new constitution put in once to ensure stability to the Republic. It was meant to limit armed resistance in the provinces, strengthen the government and force the provinces to act as a part of Rome instead of several semi-independent countries that were loyal to Rome. The Pompeian defeat finished the first goal. Now was a consolidation of power at the expense of the other political institutions. He passed several laws such as the Sumptuary Law which limited the purchase of luxury items, as well as the census was designated to limit the strain on the granary. This was a part of the Bread and Circuses Act where Romans were given grains and entertainment to keep them from going insane and smashing everything. He made it so only equestrians or senators could serve as jurors and pass a large family reward. Meaning that families that had the required or more children could receive the reward, this was to increase the population to recover from the civil war. He built the Forum of Caesar with the Temple of Venus Genetrix within. Venus was the mother of the Romans but more importantly, the matriarch of the Caesar family. Regulating the state purchase of grain for the Bread and Circuses Act and made arrangements for land allotments for his 15,000 veterans. The largest change was the calendar reform. Changing from the traditional Roman lunar calendar to the more accurate Egyptian solar calendar. Setting the table for a 365.25 day year and leap day every 4th February. This is surprisingly close to the actual duration of the year, 365.2422 days. A slight issue though, the two calendars are extremely out of sync and this needed to be corrected. In 46 BC, the Anasim Fusionis, the year of confusion began. Three intercalary months were added after February to straighten out the days. I'm sure you're wondering about the festivals that were held at the same time every year, but Caesar ensured everyone that they weren't going to change. October festivals would still be in October, but they would technically be three months later as to account for the temporary months added. This resulted in the year 46 BCE having 445 days with 45 BCE being the first year to use a new calendar system. Aside from political reforms, he also championed infrastructure and developmental policies. Carthage, and Corinth, two ancient cities with prestige nearing the Rome lie in ruins for years. Caesar ordered them to be rebuilt and reduced the need for Roman intermediaries and civil tax collection, leaving it up to the city. The Temple of Mars, a theater, and a library rivaling the former Library of Alexandria were planned. Ostia was planned to be converted into a major port and a canal was to be dug through the Isthmus of Corinth, the small land bridge connecting it with the mainland. Most importantly, he wasn't content to rest on his laurels, having drawn up plans to fight the Slavic nations of modern-day Romania and the Parthians of Persia to avenge the death of his ally Crassus. This was planned to happen on the 18th of March, 44 BCE, three days after the Ides of March. In early 44 BC, he was named Censor Vitae, so long as he lived. Coins with Caesar's face were minted and a golden knot throne was placed in the Senate. 
he was permitted to wear his triumph robes which were solid purple at his pleasure and had the imperial cult around him made, with Antony as its chief priest. This would be used as justification for Caesar's ambition to be a king. The purple robes and golden chairs were common for kings. The purple robes in particular as the only way to attain purple, color code 102, 2, 60, was to process thousands of Tyrian snails, bonus branderies. He also increased the number of magistrates which diluted their powers but allowed for more experienced magistrates to choose from later. In February 44 BCE Caesar was bestowed the title of dictator in perpetuum, or for how long he wished. Finally, he passed a law that allowed him to appoint everyone, magistrates, consuls, and tribunes, meaning that they acted on behalf of Caesar and not the people. On the 14th of March, 44 BCE, Caesar's wife Calpurnia is said to have told him of a dream she had that something terrible was to happen to him tomorrow. If though had divine influence or something that was added after, we don't know. Caesar responded by saying that if he listened and refused to attend the synod meeting tomorrow because his wife had a prophetic dream about him, there would be no way he would be respected. Being afraid of dreams that may not happen. This could be a misunderstanding of who said it as a seer of the fates also declared that the eyes of March boded poorly for Caesar. Whichever is true, Calpurnia was right. In an undisclosed location, a group calling themselves Liberators planned an attack on Caesar on the Ides of March. The 15th day. Mark Antony was said to have been notified of this by Publius Servilius Casculungus of this plot. Gain Street Bonius is said to have detained him outside the Senate chamber. Though Plutarch says that it was Brutus Albinus, so it could have been anyone I guess. I say that Palmby's skeleton teleported to the spot and rattled his bones menacingly. That's almost certainly not what happened but whatever. What did happen is that when Caesar entered the building, Lucius Tullius Summer distracted him by asking for his brother to be allowed to return. It's debated how Caesar reacted but Simber yanks on Caesar's toga, making him cry out why this is violence. Casca drew a blade and tried but failed to stab him in the neck. Caesar said, according to Plutarch, Casca, you villain, what are you doing? This being likely out of shock and not an honest question. Casca then said in Greek, Adelphi, both I, help brother, according to Eutropius, Sixty men surrounded Caesar and stabbed him as he was on the ground, blinded by blood and defenseless. Of the sixty people, Marcus, Brutus and Albinius included, only twenty-three actually partook in the murder. The others were said to cover themselves in blood to be a part of the act of quote, unquote liberation by murdering someone in the Senate. Before he died, Caesar was likely to have said, Kaisai, Tinkin meaning into you my child in Greek when he saw Marcus Brutus. Scholars debate this as it's kinda hard to say for certain what someone said as they died nearly two millennia ago. Of the liberators, however, they marched through Rome, stained with blood, and announced that they were free. Most citizens did what any normal person would do if they saw a group of senators coated in blood announcing that they were free, lock the doors and hide. Which I mean, fair. If I saw my local official and their political staff with weapons and blood splattered clothing, I'd probably lock the door too. Call the cops just for good measures. Eventually, things started to calm down. The men, who referred to themselves as liberators, said that they did not kill a man, but a tyrant, a despot, a wannabe king. This somewhat settled down everything and Rome settled into an uneasy calm. When the time came to read Caesar's will, Mark Antony had it brought before the Senate mere days after the assassination. It is noteworthy that the wax elephant, the seal of legitimacy was already broken, meaning that Mark Antony already knew a portion of the will's content. I personally throw doubt. On the legitimacy of the will as the seal was broken before it was read at the Senate meeting. If Mark Antony wished, he could have modified or changed what was written. Before it was announced, 
Mark Antony proposed a compromise, the quote, unquote liberators will be absolved and in turn, those appointed by Caesar will remain. This brokered a tenuous peace and allowed the will to be read. Much of the content was shocking, as Caesar made it a point to be generous. For each of the roughly 450,000 citizens of the city, Caesar personally willed to them 75 Attic drachmas. This is a large sum of money as a skilled laborer can make a drachma after a day's work, and Caesar just gave away 33.75 million days wages to the city's citizens. He also willed that many of his personal gardens and orchards be converted into public parks. Most potent of all is the naming of an heir. Choosing not to legitimize any of his bastards, technically, Caesar named the grandson of his elder sister, his primary heir. Gaius Octavianus, known to history as Augustus Caesar or simply Octavian. Should he not accept, Decimus Unius Brutus Albinus, would be named as his heir. The same Brutus Albinus that liberated Rome from Caesar's grasp. By accepting, Gaius Octavius could bear the name Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus Ernest. For his funeral, Caesar asked that he be cremated and laid to rest next to his daughter. Mark Antony declared that they should break customs and hold his funeral within the city limits. This received a large pushback but was allowed to happen as the liberators were in a tenuous position. The body of Caesar was brought before the people and set up on a wooden stage. At the head of the stage, Antony spoke. As told by the eternal bard, William Shakespeare from his play Julius Caesar Act 3 Scene 2, he said quote, Friends, Romans, countrymen, let me hear yours. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turned with their bones. So let it be with Caesar, the noble Brutus. Hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault. And grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome. Whose ransoms did the general coffers fill? Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the loop purple. I thrice presented him a kingly crown. Which you did thrice refuse, was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And, sure. He is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke. But here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then, to mourn for him? O oh judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts. And men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me." Unquote. Antony stopped several times to gesture to Caesar, allowing emotions to stir. While Shakespeare's writing on the incident may not be entirely accurate, the sentiment was the same. The people were told that a vile man had died, yet standing before them was the friend of said vile man, recounting all the good he did. This was followed by the oration of Caesar's final will a will in which he declared that Rome itself would be one of his heirs, with Gaius Octavius being his primary heir and Brutus Albinus, their liberator, and tyrant slayer, being your secondary heir. To say that an uproar began would be to say fire was hot or the sun was bright. Caesar was the champion of the people. Everything he did was to better the lives eyed Rome and its people. He fought for them, bled for them, died for them. So what if he was a king if it made the lives of the people better? The senators and aristocrats saw him as a threat in the Adam Guild. 
Tensions reached their breaking point and the people stormed the stage and took the body of Caesar. The wooden structure was dismantled and Caesar was placed in the center, turning the forum into the dictator's funerary pyre. That was not enough. Nearby buildings were stripped down and added to the fire. Gold and jewelry, fabrics, clothes, and accessories that they found were added to the pyre. The lictors needed to step in and prevent the situation from further devolving. Yet the die was cast. The public had turned on the liberators as they had killed their beloved Caesar for their own goals. Mark Antony seized the situation and declared the second triumvirate with Lepidus and Octavius. They fought the liberators for the good of Rome. Marcus Brutus, Brutus Albinus, and many others joined together against the three men. Of those opposing them was one man by the name of Sextus Pompeius Pius, the son of Pompey who took control of Sicily. The second triumvirate was officially and legally known as the triumvirate for organizing the Republic. It gave each man absolute command over sections of the Republic territory. So in the process of defending the Republic, the Liberators dealt its final blow. This post-Caesarian civil war saw the Republican forces raise 45 legions, nearly 240,000 men to defeat the Liberators' forces. To fund this, the Triumvirate enacted a prescription, the seizure of land and wealth of anyone who was an issue. Of these victims, Cicero stood in staunch opposition. He decried the issuing of the proscription. Having seen what happened to Rome when Sulla issued the same decades prior. Yet he did not run nor hide. He knew that his time drew near and accepted it. To try and state the impact that Cicero had on history would be to try to count the drops of water in the ocean. He left a mark on history that eclipsed most families. Of them, the works de Republica and Elegibus stand out as some of his most significant works. On the 7th of December, 43 BC, the last defender of the Republic was beheaded by order of Mark Antony. What followed was a civil war with Gaius Julius Caesar against Pompeius Magnus, sound familiar? That is a story for another time. If you want me to cover Imperator Augustus Caesar, let me know. With hindsight, it's clear to see that Caesar was becoming too powerful, and thus, a threat. But that's always the case with hindsight, it allows us to see what was not obvious to the people back then. To the Senate and the elite of Rome, Caesar was a despot that would lead to the end of the Republic, they were right about Julius Caesar, but chose the wrong one. The public had a differing view. For his men, Caesar granted them land, property, a source of income. He gave large donations of coins to them. For the citizens, he gave rights to thousands of settlements on the fringes of Roman society, built large public works and increased the standards of living for many areas. This diametrically opposed view has led to the muddled view on the man in legend. He was the man who set the groundwork for the Roman Empire, but he was also the man who was beloved by the Romans and changed much of society, one way or another. Most of the information was taken from writings by Caesar, accounts according to Suetonius, Plutarch, and many other lesser sources. If a source is closer to the date, then it is likely that the information is more credible compared to something written decades or centuries after. William Shakespeare's account of Caesar would hold less water compared to Suetonius's writings decades around the time. But what do you think? Was Gaius Julius Caesar a tyrant who was trying to be a king or was he a righteous man that bettered Rome and was killed for being too powerful, having committed crimes and doing so? I've been the Irish Explainer, and this has been a brief history on Caesar from 45 to 44 BCE. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to place them in the comments below. Let me know what I should cover next. Have a great day and make sure to like, comment, and subscribe.